Now, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's one o'clock block. This is Global Changes uh, with uh, a retired Second Circuit Chief Judge, uh, Judge Shackley Ruffetto, uh, who has pairs a lot and has been to China a lot. And he's happy to talk with us about cultural changes in China, namely the book by, um, let's see, Desmond Shum yeah. uh, called Red Roulette. It's very interesting. Uh, Shackley, welcome to the show. Nice to see your smiling face. Thanks, Jay. Good to be here. Good to see you. So, okay. So, um, you know, we, we look from the outside in because uh, China is a kind of a place that has a mm, guardrails around it these days. Not everybody wants to go there, um, but we need to study it for so many reasons. And one of the things we study is, uh, you know, the books coming out, the testimonies provided by people who've been on the inside. Desmond Chum is one yeah. of those people. <clears throat> and he wrote this, he lives in the United States, I guess. And he wrote this book and it's like a bestseller because it has an insight into what goes on in business and for that matter in a social experience in China, um, which is dramatically changing. Uh, you, you've read the book and you've seen a video, which was very good, of uh, Desmond Chum, Chum, Chum talking about his book. Uh, where is he coming from? What is this all about? Well, he he uh, he was a Hong Kong boy who uh, came from a poor upbringing and then uh, was educated eventually in the United States, went back to Hong Kong and then started working, I guess, in an investment uh, fund organization, ended up in Beijing running their office and then branched out on his own and be it became extraordinarily successful. But it seems that it was uh, had a lot to do with uh, Whitney, his wife that he met, who was uh, also had a similar background, although from a different area. But she was very good at networking. And she was able to establish a, a close networking relationship with, uh, with the wife of then premier, um, uh, Wen Jiabao of China. And that opened a huge number of doors for them. And uh, they, they, he describes that in great detail in the book. And he goes into a really interesting detail. You know, we're all on the outside, so we just guess at this stuff, but this guy was actually right in the middle and made billions of dollars from zero. And so he knows what he's talking about. Uh, I have a couple of paragraphs, which I'd like to read if you don't mind. Oh, I, please, I'd like to feel the prose of it. Okay, he's, he starts out, Whitney and Auntie Zhang, that's uh, Wen Jiabao's wife, and, and Whitney is, is his wife, had a verbal agreement that Auntie Zhang would get 30% of any profit from our joint enterprises, and we and any other partners would share the remaining 70%. In theory, the Wens were responsible for putting up 30% of the capital as well, but they rarely did. In the few instances that they provided capital, it was always after the project was a sure bet. Auntie Zhang never took any risk, so we deducted their investment stake when we distributed the profits. Nothing was on paper, it was all done on trust. The arrangement generally followed the industry, quote, industry standard, end quote. Other families of high ranking party members extracted a similar percentage in exchange for their political influence. The template was always fungible and could be tweaked to accommodate investment opportunities as they arose. Chinese officials, executives of state-owned companies and private businessmen who are close to the party uh, presented uh, insiders like Auntie Zhang with opportunities all the time. But the deals were not as, weren't as sweet as those available to China's red aristocrats. Those would be the children of the people who founded the Communist Party. They would get deals like they could sell all the water to, on all the trains in the Chinese railway system. You know, they're making billions of dollars. Finally, let me just read this. This is interesting. This is about how you network. It says, neither Whitney nor I felt uh, much discomfort spending more than $1,000 on lunch. To me, it was just the cost of doing business in China in the 2000s. That's how things were done. A big element was the Chinese concept of face. Everybody knew we were playing, paying ridiculous prices for the soup, the fish, and even the veggies. And it was precisely that fact that gave our our guest face. If I'd been buying lunch for my personal consumption, I would have looked at it as a value proposition, but I wasn't uh, there for fun. I was there for business and I wanted to do business in Beijing. And that's what lunch cost. <laughs> Pretty interesting. Wow. wow. 
<laughs> of course, of course, the owner of the restaurant was also in on it, wasn't he? Yeah, he was uh, <laughs> all the way to the bank, right? <laughs> he was related to the guy with the water. <laughs> you, know, you know, to give you some perspective, you know, I first went to China in 1984. I was coming back from Navy duty in the Philippines and I, I went to Hong Kong. And those that was just what five years after Chairman Mao died. And you couldn't even go into China before that, I don't think. But and it was still hard. But I happened to stop at the China Travel Beer. I said, hey, you know, and the guys guy said, well, do you have a visa? And I said, no. He says, you got ten dollars. I guess. <laughs> he went in the other room and he came back with a visa. <laughs> so, so I, I thought, OK, that's, that's, that's friendly. That was my introduction to mainland China. <laughs> and, uh, and I went on this great 10 day tour and um uh near guangzhou and but it was really primitive there's like zero trace of western culture there were no cars only bicycles there were no this is guangzhou which is a huge metropolis now and uh there were six-story buildings with bamboo scaffolding and stuff like that we went to a lot of factories and places but it was it was very third world nothing modern at all and then i happened to passed through Beijing on a couple day layover in 1994. And it was incredibly different just in that short period of time. There were cars everywhere, big fancy hotels and Hummers. And, and then of course, it's just gotten more and more ever since. And uh, in the past well, 15 years or so, I've been there many times and for long periods. I've been to probably 20 different cities in China and lectured at oh. schools and, wow. you know. Yeah. Well, what impresses you is, is beyond the fact that it's way different than it was the last time you looked is that while you're watching, it's growing. And I remember my, my yeah. first trip to, um, what was it, Shanghai, um, you know, we arrived late, um, we, it's dark, and we're looking at these buildings, and there are lights, uh, construction scaffolding lights all over the buildings. Those yeah. guys work 24 by 7. Um, you know, that building was going to go up and really soon. Uh, and I said, well, this is a city that grows while you watch yeah. dramatically. Yeah. You know, uh, when I was there in 84, uh, people were really poor and there'd be motor scooters or the big basket with chickens in it and stuff like that. But no one was sitting around. Everybody was going here, going there, doing something, selling something. Um, that was sort of the beginning of selling things. But uh, the energy was unmistakable, no question. I mean, even in Hong Kong was, of course, the same, but in mainland China, you, you just felt it. I mean, I, I just sort of felt at the time, boy, big things are going to happen here. And you still feel that kind of energy uh, with this, when you talk to the students. I'll say this, too. I, I met a lot of people in China. I made some good friends, and uh, they're great people. You know, I always had a wonderful time. I did get crosswise with the government a little bit at one point, but aside from that, uh, I always had a wonderful time in China and met some really nice people. Well, um, uh, Desmond, uh, Desmond Shu's wife did not have a wonderful time. She no. may have been friendly with uh, Auntie, was it Auntie Jang? Um, but at the end of the day, she paid a terrible price for knowing Auntie Jang. Can you talk about it? Well, I just I, I haven't finished the book, but I, so I don't know the real details, but I saw his interview and he basically said that they had uh, parted ways. So they were divorced, but they had they had um, they they built a huge complex onto the uh, Beijing International Airport, which was used for customs and, you know, uh, 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 international trade center. They and were into real estate. This was a real estate development operation. Yeah. Yeah, and then they and then they build a huge uh, office complex someplace in Beijing, and she was, I guess, running that. And then one day she went to work, and she was disappeared, like the like the uh, Canadians who were just released. And she's still disappeared. And he said that uh, he was living in London at the time. I don't know if he still lives there. I guess the son is with him. And uh, he said that the day before it was to come out, the book that he wrote which is basically a tell-all. He said he got a phone call from her. He don't know where she is. He hadn't heard from her. No one had heard from her. And he got a telephone call asking him not to publish the book. And uh, he said it was too late by then. It was already out in the shelves and about to be announced. 
So yeah, they, that's, a, that's sort of ridiculous. And he said in the interview that that was a real ridiculous call because they, you know they don't print it on the day they release it. They print it months before. It was already printed. It was as you say, it was already on the shelves, and yeah. some some bureaucrat. Uh, who didn't know better was uh, forcing her to call him to try to stop it. Uh, I'm not sure that he could have stopped it even if he wanted, but he didn't want to stop it either. <laughs> yeah, he he. he I recommend the book to anybody who's interested in how China actually works, especially during the big go-go period when it was expanding. And one of the th one of the points he makes is that he both of them, he and his wife, both believed that China was in an expansion. Uh, an expansionary period, but also uh, an evolving period where rights would be, you know, more easily protected, and that uh, it would be an op continuous opening up process, which of course doesn't look like it's continuing. Um, but they all believed that at the time, and they thought that they were contributing to making China great again, and. Um, and so they believed in what they were doing, you know, that it was, while it was helping them and they could prosper, they were also doing something good for their country. She was a pretty serious player. For her to disappear like that is troubling. Um, but I guess uh, she was caught at the tail end of the, what was his name, Wen Xiaobo uh, scandal, where Xi Jinping um, decided that Wen Xiaobo was not loyal to him. And all of a sudden, uh, there was this big corruption charge. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's clear, uh, you know, uh, from Desmond Shu Shum, um, that that corruption is just another way of doing power, of doing control, of getting rid of your enemies. It's yeah, not he, really corruption at all. Yeah, he, when he one of the things he reiterates, which I'd learned myself, is that the the, the judicial judicial system is just another instrument of Communist Party uh, uh, control. And they, they use it whenever it's necessary. And, um, uh, and, and also, the way they're constantly changing policies and changing the, the legal requirements, say, uh, applicable to development and getting permits. And, you know, it gets more and more complex. But they're also, he said, very vague, so that it's really easy to charge someone with violating the law. And that's what happens in these corruption scandals is that they can always find something. And when they pass a new law, they make it retroactive. So you're, so you're, you can't win. <laughs> you can't win. Heads, heads I win, tails you lose. <laughs> Which for anybody with a legal back, you know, without a legal background, that'd be illegal in the United States. <laughs> ex, post, ex post facto law, but in China, it's a tool of the, of Communist Party control. I mean, that's pretty frightening if you think about it. Well, uh, Desmond Shum uh, managed to uh, navigate through it. And he talked about a given project where he had to get, I think it was uh, 167 permits. <laughs> yes. And they all cost him some money. But he had to, he had to go around and develop Guanxi uh, with with all all levels of the bureaucracy. You couldn't just convince the top guy. You had to, because the the lower guys control the top guys, and, and uh, it's just quite an interesting story. Now, in the interview, uh, the, the the panel, there were a panel of three interviewing him. Um, they asked him, "What about Guanxi? Is Guanxi is important, isn't it, in China? And you have to have Guanxi to do business." And his his answer, if you recall, was really interesting. Yeah. You know, the old Guanxi is is dead. It's over. Guangxi, if you want to even use that term, it's different now. Do you remember that conversation, Shekley? Yeah, yeah. He basically said you have to, you you uh, you do you ingratiate yourself with someone and you make their life better, <laughs> usually economically. Yeah. And that's, it's and transactional. That's, and Whitney was apparently really an expert at doing that, and, <laughs> and he recognized that, and they made a good combination because he he had a, a financial and accounting background. And so he, he was able to bring that to the party, and she was really good at, at networking. A great team they were. I, I'm too bad they, they fell apart. Um, but maybe it was under the pressure of what was happening to, to her and possibly to him. And it's not clear to me that he could go back. I don't think he could go back. Oh, and after writing this book, there's no way in his, his life that he can go back because he really, he really uh, pulls the rug out from under um, you know, the PRC. 
But one, one thing that sticks with me, Shackley, and I wanted to ask you about it because you're much closer to it than me, is that he talked about the hierarchy of power. And uh, this is a sort of uh, an extension of what I was saying about uh, Guanxi. Um, and, and, and that had uh, that was expressed in the way the table at this thousand dollar lunch, for example, was mm -hmm. ordered. And um, everybody had a seat at the table in a special place. And it was hierarchical. And it was, it was not necessarily family, uh, although um, the, the children of a powerful government uh, bureaucrat would, would be powerful also. Mm -hmm. But it was based on power, not necessarily Guanxi or you know, old times forgotten, but power. And, and my, my impression of his discussion on that point is that this yeah. was new. This was new, this had, this had emerged even in recent years. Uh, and it was a, a, a emblematic of the change in culture, if you will. That's our title of our show today, the change in culture, business culture, yeah. government power culture that, that has happened in China. The ordering, the simple ordering of the table. Well, um... I don't. I I think that that's partially traditional because I I know when I've been uh, uh you know our friend Russell the Ude helped me a lot uh get find my way around China, and uh, he, he his he and his dean invited me to lunch. I I actually had lunch with them several times. But when I went there, they put me uh, on the on the farthest side from the door, and I didn't. You know know what it meant and russell told me later well that means you're you're the important guest in the room so i, I think that some of that's just chinese culture but then they've taken it in to to extremes it's like feng shui it's uh it's it's physical it's the geographical location of the people involved yeah yeah i, I think if you went into a chinese a traditional chinese dinner and you were set by the door it would tell you something <laughs> Like kitchen <laughs> or the lavatoire or, the, or if it didn't have a private room <laughs> yeah right well i you know the, the thing is uh, the point he was trying to make in that in that little discussion which left me in wonderment um is that um the way things work in business is different now it's more transactional the way the, the government has its tentacles into everything including business is transactional now you know, uh, you, you spoke, for example, of the fact that years back, not that many years back, uh, 10, 20 years ago, that, that was when I was making my trips there. Um, there was this sense of um, we're, we're going Western. Uh, we're comfortable for you. You know, we'll, we'll serve you a hamburger if you want. Frankie's, Frankie's in, in Beijing was an example, a restaurant there. Um, and, um, and we'll, um, uh, we'll we, we will... Um, um, you know, we'll, we'll work together. We'll, we'll make deals with the West and, and uh, you can be part of that. Although they retained all that thing about the wholly owned woofy uh, and, the, and the requirement to have a local partner and all that, um, yeah. there, there was a certain opening, a fresh opening, as, as you mentioned. And, and what he was saying, uh, I think Desmond Schumann, at least in his uh, discussion on the interview, was that, that that's changed now. Um, before um, the holy, the um, government-owned enterprises were like fading from the scene, fading from power. Now they're back and they're more powerful yet and they control everything now. And private companies are not nearly as powerful. You, you recall that part of the discussion? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, the, one of the big crises going on now is the, is the uh, what looks like the bankruptcy of Evergrande, which is the second largest property developer in China. It's apparently has the largest debt of any property developer in the world, uh, over $300 million. Uh, and billion, billion. 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 Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> By Chinese standards. And uh, and there, the, the latest thing I heard is that, is that the plan will be to um, uh, uh, for the government to allow it to fail, but break, but break it up. And so it'll end up being owned by state-owned enterprises. And that makes sense. I mean, within China, they can always print as much money as they want, which they've done in the past. And, uh, 
But the, the, one, the one question is, is that on Thursday, their uh, dollar denominated bonds come due. And I'm assuming that since they're dollar denominated, they're probably purchased by, uh, you know, Americans or others, not in China. And, and if they default on those, it, it may affect uh, companies like BlackRock and, and other uh, investors in China. Um, so it have, you mean if, if the U.S. defaults on those bonds? Yeah. Well, well, they're dollar-denominated Evergrande bonds. Well, they're bonds out of Evergrande. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But well, we have the possibility of that our bonds, our bonds, will be subject to default also if Congress doesn't act on the debt yeah. ceiling. Yeah. The, well, well, China has lots of dollar reserves, as I understand it. So they could probably, if it, if it, if a, you know, state-owned organization takes it over and the government banks support it, why they can manage all that. But it's uh, there's a lot of speculation about that right now. So what does it mean with these uh, uh, Evergrande and the uh, three hundred billion dollars of debt uh, and defaulting on the bonds because of government intercession? What does that mean? Well, it, it, it goes, it, it's consistent with, with what uh, the book says, you know, about the, about, uh, the uh, entrepreneurial spirit being dampened down. Uh, as I understand it, um, property, property development in general is like 20 to 30% of the GDP of China. So it's a huge chunk and it's going to affect a whole lot of people. And of course, uh, the party has to make sure that that doesn't significantly disrupt their society. So uh, they're gonna move on. I understand about a hundred property developers have already gone bankrupt in China, according to the internet. Uh, so that could, that could change things uh, big time, I think, both in terms of what the party does in terms of control and also um, it's, you know, the interest of outsiders in investing in China, which is already uh, a problem. Yeah, well, the, the, the magic word is control. I mean, we've seen in the past um, several months, and, and most recently, you know, when it occurred to me, and it seemed to me, that uh, Xi Jinping uh, and the PRC was into, into control, and uh, it was expressing that in everything it did. Uh, mm -hmm. Just things that come to mind at random is, uh, you know, it, it has been much more, much more uh, oppressive in Hong Kong than it needs to be. Uh, it's been uh, much more threatening to Taiwan than it needs to be. Uh, mm -hmm. And its actions in the South China Sea much more aggressive than it really needs to be. Um, and I, you know, then you look at the things uh, domestically. Uh, why, why terminate the tutoring business? Uh, is that is that really necessary? Is there a point? Um, and uh, gee, there were several other things that I've heard recently, where it seems that uh, Xi Jinping is trying to put controls on everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess. That is, you know, the common denominator seems to be, we, this is the new China, the new Xi Jinping China. Xi Jinping is like Mao, uh, or he wants to be, and he wants to control everything. And that's, the, that's good for China. But query, is it really good for China uh, when you can't even understand exactly what benefit he's earning with it? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you would think not, but, um, if, if control is all you're interested in, you know, uh, but, you know, one of the things that always impressed me was uh, how, the, you know, when you, if you teach in a law school there, everybody speaks English, so you lecture in English. Uh, and it surprised me how common it was amongst young people. And uh, I realized that the, the government made the decision that people should learn English. But now uh, Mao has, as you say, shut down the, uh, language tutoring industry, which was primarily English, as far as I know. Um, and that's a big, so that's a real statement, I think, that he's going to, he's going to close things down and turn inward, uh, which is, which is difficult to understand, because it's an export based economy. And, um, you know, they even, you know, they have to import all kinds of natural resources, including oil. Uh, so I don't know just how insular they could actually get. Yeah, and there's, and there's some of the other things he's done. He's, he's tightened, um, oh, uh, export of intellectual property. Mm -hmm. um, the University of Hawaii and a number of other 
big schools from the mainland recently had a panel program in which all of their cyber people got together and talked about intrusions into American universities by China, mm -hmm. which had been dramatically increasing, uh, increasing by the by by Chinese operatives and mm -hmm. also by uh, cyber cyber techniques. And that's part of an initiative also. China is active in trying to get intellectual property from the US, but mm -hmm. closing down any possibility the US will get any intellectual property from China. Mm -hmm. uh, this is more aggressive than we've seen. And, and it's a disappointment as against what you and I saw um, 20, 30 years ago with the reopening. It's not reopening now, it's closing. Mm -hmm. And part of it is this cultural thing. Part of it is this control of business. Uh, where, where does this all take us, Shackley? Uh, you know, here's, here's a country that would like to present itself in the United Nations as, as a bunch of heroes uh, doing the right thing for the world, um, you know, with high moral standards. Which, which is just, that's fake. Um, you know, doing things in Xinjiang that are unforgivable. They're atrocities, mm -hmm. um, but they're going to the United Nations and telling everybody they want to save the world. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's so visible, it's so obvious. Um, it's so, mm, what's the word, illusory. What, what, what's going on here? Well, I think, I don't know, I think, I, you know, it, you might add that Belt and Road Initiative and, sure. and activities in Africa, getting ports and so on. Um, I think they're going to find, like we have, is that you can't export your culture someplace else. You know, we just found that out big time in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. And well, I, but can I, you create an image? Can you create? <laughs> you know, with the press today, even with you know, the press is being suppressed. Right, that's another element. Of yeah. this turning inward thing, it's being seriously suppressed. Not only the American press, but the press in general, um, trying to control the message again. Control. So you know how how does that really play when when the China goes to the United Nations and takes these lofty positions, um, and and tries to get control in the United Nations, but at the same time it's doing you know very in, inconsistent things in China domestically, and as you say through Belt Road. Mm -hmm. um, where does that lead? It's a mixed bag for sure. Uh, is it sustainable? What does the world really think? What is the world really going to do? Is China going to be able to muscle its way into these deals? Or are people going to, you know, get very suspicious? Well, it, it seems like it seems like as long as they're they're offering profit opportunities, foreigners are going to continue to pour money in there. Um, I think China is one of the largest uh, economic partners of Germany, for instance, which is dominated by their car industry. Um, so are they going to withdraw? I don't know. You know, what about the European European Union has a deal on hold, I guess, but they're not happy with America at the moment. So they might go ahead and make a deal. Australia seems to be out and so does the UK. But, you know, if there's plenty of capital around. And as long as people are willing to invest in China, I don't, you know, they're going to, that's going to create power for them, right? Yeah. So here we are. We're into Xi Jinping for about 10 years now. Uh, he certainly has uh, left his impression on things. And what he's doing now is, uh, is, is visible. Um, and, um, you know, nobody, nobody can miss the general direction of that. But where, where is it going to take us? My question is to ask you what you think is going to happen in the future. This control, this control thing is going to go forward for sure. It's yeah. going to increase the threats to Taiwan, South China Sea, Hong Kong, probably going to increase. But what about business? What about the ordering of business society, if you will? Um, what about the control of large corporations? I mean, look what he did to Alibaba. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and Jack Ma, Jack Ma had his, had his feathers pulled right out. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, no, no big company can exist around Xi Jinping. He's mm -hmm. going to break them up every time. He doesn't want them to be powerful. Um, so is that going to continue? What, what do you see the direction, the result of this, this kind of strategy, say, five or 10 years? Well, if he's around, and that's a question mark, um, I think it's going to continue the way it is. You know, Xi Jinping thought being taught to grammar school, 
Yeah, it's, it's just like the Red Book, you know, Chairman Mao. It's, just, it's as you say, the same game plan. And uh, I, the question I have, though, is can, could China actually turn inward? I mean, that's its history, you know. In the long run, that's what it did. Is it, It's the Middle Kingdom and, and folded in on itself, didn't need any, any outsiders. I don't see how that can actually be done, but, you know, uh, they're pretty resourceful people. So I, but, but as long as he's around now, I understand that, that that's not necessarily assured under that system. So we'll see. But I, I try to make himself, you know, premier for life, didn't he? Uh, is, is that going to stick? Well, so far, it changed, he changed the constitution. I think there's a big meeting next year, isn't there, about uh, over that to see whether he's continued or not. That'll be interesting. But you know, it's a power play. So uh, if he's still in power, I'm sure that that's what's going to happen. I don't think he's going to attack Taiwan, though, to tell you the truth. Um, uh, he'll just continue to, I mean, why would he attack Taiwan? He might lose, and then what? You know, that'd be a disaster. Yeah. So I don't think he'd, he would take that chance. It's, it's better for him to turn inward, control what he can, and, uh, and deal with whatever problems he has inside where he can control it all. Last question, Jacqueline. Okay, given that, um, how do we adjust foreign policy uh, to deal with, with him? How do you and I adjust our view of China? You know, the, the point on that is that 10, 20 years, 30 years ago, it was a luscious pomegranate. It was yeah. great to go over there, love the people, love the culture, love yeah. everything around you. So this is one of the most active, vivacious societies that ever happened on the planet. Now you really can't say that, nor can you go back. Um, so how do we adjust our, our conduct? And if we're business people, our business with them uh, yeah. in the next five years, so how do we calculate for, I mean, uh, how do we compensate for what's happening? Oh, compensate. Well, I, I think we're out, out of luck in China for the time being. Uh, I'm looking forward to going back to Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> All your Mandarin words are not lost forever. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great place. <laughs> it is. It is a democracy, God bless. And it has lots of Chinese culture. <laughs> <laughs> All the best things. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, I, are you worried though, honestly? Are you worried that somehow this this control, this this um, you know one person government, okay, this this thing that's turning into what amounts to a dictatorship, subject of course to that meeting next year, and whatever other machinations you see in the Politburo, um, aren't you worried that a dictatorship of that size, where the guy who runs it is so powerful that what he wakes up on, you know, every morning could affect the world. Mm -hmm. um, is, this, is this good for the world? Is it good for us? Is it something we need to be concerned about? Well, I don't think it's good, but it, but it, I think it's going in a direction where things might change. Uh, you know, if anything is going to change in China, it's going to change because the Chinese people change it. And uh, I've asked friends in China, I said, you know, China has a government structure and then it has the Communist Party, which runs everything and controls the army. So they have a government and they have a judiciary. So if they didn't have the party, you know, they would have a bureaucracy in place so they could operate. And I, I asked them, you know, given that, if you could get rid of the communists or if you ever, if the communists were deposed, could that be done in a peaceful way? So you could just transition to a normal government. They said, no. <laughs> and won't happen. And I think that's true. They'll take another revolution of some sort. Uh, and, I, and I think that the closing down of China is going to promote that. That's my own take. Very last question, which, you know, your last comment provokes me to ask this. You know. uh, it was a huge mistake, uh, but Mao organized a cultural revolution in the 70s. Was it turned out to be a disaster? Maybe you could make some left-handed argument that it helped to shape modern China, but I think, I think it was more negative than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the implications, in fact, it was specifically discussed with, uh, uh, with Desmond uh, Shum, um, that you know, we, we, they might be in another kind of cultural revolution right now. Um, do you agree with that? 
Seems like it could be, yeah. Yeah, this, this um, uh, you know, emperor worship kind of thing that's going on there. Uh, I think it's a sign that things are destructing, um, but we'll see. We'll see, we'll talk about it again. I'll tell that's you, if, if China ever emerged as a democracy like Taiwan, there would be no stopping it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, don't hold your breath on that, okay? Yeah. <laughs> well, not my lifetime, I guess. You want, one can hope for the best. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Judge Shackley Raffetto, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate this. We have to follow up on it. You know that. Take care. <laughs> Aloha. Thank you.